want to talk to you today about Gethsemane. <clears throat> the story is summarized for us by Luke. Luke was a uh, Gentile convert who uh, had been led to the Lord by the Apostle Paul. He went back and did a great study. He says that he went to talk to the eyewitnesses and um, decided to put it in logical order. Uh, in fact, most of the books that uh, try to list the life of Christ in order follow Luke most of all because um, he uh, put things in pretty good chronological order. Um, so this is the historian speaking. This is the one who is saying, um, uh, here's what I have found it to be. So analyzing from the people who were there and all of this, he put it together like this. Luke 22, 39 to 46. And he, Jesus, came out and went, as was his wont, as he often did, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. Now it's Matthew and Mark that uh, actually name the area that he went to as Gethsemane. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. Now he used to say this to them again, but uh, he says it to them first. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. You know, just take your stone, throw it out a bit. So it's, it's uh, not just two steps or three steps, maybe uh, several steps away. And he kneeled down and prayed. And here we are allowed, uh, th they could hear him speak, those who were there, and this is how Luke found out about it. But here's what he said, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. The King James Margin tells us that this willing remove could be put together in a different way. If thou be willing to remove this cup from me. Uh, perhaps the, the uh, that's literally the way the Greek reads it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, it may be that he used more words than this, but this was the essence of it. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, indicating that there was a weakening within him, perhaps even uh, a weakening unto death. And being in an agony... He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Now, Luke says, for sorrow, indicating that they were sorrowing with him. But they wore out this, this time of prayer, because actually we find that he... he uh, went to God three times. He prayed three times. And said unto them, why, sleeply, rise, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So he repeats the same command that he gave them before. Uh, they should have been more earnest. And we're going to find at the end of the message what happened when they woke up suddenly uh, to his uh, rather mild rebuke. I speak this morning especially to those who walk afar off from Christ. Uh, let me try in these few minutes to draw you nearer. Uh, it may be that you think that this doesn't have much to do with you. It happened a long time ago. But I, I want to say to you that Jesus Christ's suffering to offer you salvation began before he was nailed to the cross. It began before the soldiers pounded those long thorns into his brow. It began before they whipped his back into shreds of dripping flesh. We find his suffering described for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. His love for you caused him great agony. While I can describe what I can... Uh, based on the word of God, we cannot feel as Christ felt. Um, I'm, I'm keenly aware that we have only a, a surface understanding of this. There are mysteries here known only to the transcendent triune God. Isaac Watts, in his hymn, The Gospel Feast, wrote it this way, It cost him death 
to save our lives. To buy our souls, it cost his own. And all the unknown joys he gives were bought with agonies unknown. Agonies that we will probably never be able to understand. Let me look with you at the, um, the fact of the matter here. First of all, the Savior's unspeakable agony. Uh, we want to get into this just a bit. Before this day, before he went to pray, Jesus spoke of his troubled soul. John 12, 27, he said, Now is my soul troubled. This is the word that means agitated, distressed. You know that feeling. You've been there yourself. But his soul was agitated, distressed. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. He says, I know this was my purpose, but my soul is agitated, distressed here. So he speaks of his soul. You understand that's not just his spirit, uh, which communicates with God. This is his soul, his mind, his will, his emotions. So he confessed that his mind was agitated in this thing, that his will was confused, that his emotions were deeply touched, deeply troubled. And so as he enters Gethsemane, Matthew records, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, those are James and John, and began to be sorrowful. Now this is a very powerful word. It comes from the root word to loose. If you do study the Greek language, this is the word that they use to teach you to conjugate. Luo, luos, lue, and so on. You go through all of that. But luo is the word that this comes from, to loose. And so this idea of being sorrowful is to dissolve, to be unloosed with sorrow. And very heavy, uh, meaning literally most depressed. If you've been in deep depression, you know what that can feel like. Then said he unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. This is the word meaning surrounded by grief, as if it were being pressed in with grief, even unto death, which recalls us that when he started praying this, the angel came to strengthen him. He says to them, tarry ye here and watch, stay awake, be on guard with me. How can we men understand the Son of God astonished and alarmed? That does, he seems to be beyond that. And yet here, this is what he says. He tells us that the terrors of his coming sacrifice for you surrounded him with grief. Luke 22, 44a, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Agony uh, is a picture of, of struggling for victory. This was very often the, the wrestlers who, with their mighty muscles, are pushing against each other and trying to break each other. A mental struggle with one's emotions. And th these verses show us his most extraordinary grief. Now, you and I coming to this would almost naturally say, well, yeah, he's going to get beaten, he's going to be pierced, he's going to be nailed, he's going to be whipped, he's going to be beaten with fists. Uh, and yet, let me explain before we go further. Jesus, I believe, was not fearful of dying. That's not what he's talking about here. He did not hesitate to give his life a sacrifice for sin. I base that not on my imagination, but look with me at these verses. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. He understood this. He was explaining this. This was not something that troubled him. Luke 9, 51. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is, this is the bravery that eliminates this as being a, a, a problem of dying. Luke 12, 49 to 51. I am come to set fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? 
but I have a baptism to be baptized with. He says, I'm going to be put immersed down into a kind of a baptism here, but um, that will be his, his death. And how am I straightened? This is the word for pained. I am pained. I am straightened is, is to be narrowed, pressed in upon, till it be accomplished. He said, this life is restricted until I die and raise again. Then I will have all power again. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. So he said, I'm going to, to offer salvation. Some will say yes. Some will say no and will hate you that said yes. Division. So he said, this will be a release for me. Finally being done with this body. And in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. He was very clear. He was very determined. He was very set. Uh, this did not take him as a surprise. He knew this was going to happen. So the question is then, what was it that terrified Jesus? Here's my answer. He saw he was taking man's sin upon him. When I say man's sin, I'm not talking about when you were three and you raided the cookie jar. Those are sins, that type of thing. Doing things that are wrong, those are sins. But what he was dealing with was sin, the sin condition. You know why we do sins? Because we are a sinner. The man is not a thief because he steals. He steals because he's a thief. We sin because we are sinners. And it is that sin condition, the actual disease that causes us to do wrong, that he was going to have to take on himself. He was going to have to pay for that. He saw his separation from God, his father. And this had never happened before. This is son of God. This was the one who lived with him in eternity. Eternal beings, never separated, always bound by love. But that separation was coming. And Jesus saw sin in its most horrible reality. He recognized its absolute contradiction of the very nature of God. He saw its destructive influence upon mankind. I think that's why he wept at Lazarus' tomb. It's come to this, that these people that we love, they, they die because of sin. He knew the horrors that sin brought on man by separating from, from God. And unless you receive the offered salvation, you stay separated from God forever. At this stage, he's on the verge of becoming sin. I'm not even sure what that means, but that's what we're told, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, speaking of God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Jesus, who knew no sin, but he was to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin that we could have God's righteousness. Isaiah 53, 6, And all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. This is what I want, you see. And the Lord hath laid on him, laid on him, the iniquity of us all. Let me test your imagination. If you can imagine the eternal purity of the triune God, whose very nature opposes sin, like a, a pure crystal pond, where my wife and I were... Uh, asked to go down to uh, Cancun, Mexico, for a wedding that I, I was 
marrying some folks. And we walked out into the water and uh, we got up to my chest. I looked down, I could see my toes on the white sand, crystal clear stuff. And then there's a nasty old sewer pipe right next to this crystal pond. And suddenly gushing out of it comes this horrible black filth and slime pouring in, defiling this. You could imagine the eternal purity of God and then the gushing forth of putrid sin of mankind into that pure soul. He's paying the price for all mankind. What horrible sin poured into him on that day. I think a key to this whole thing is that Jesus prayed, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. I've shared with you before what I discovered by studying this concept of the cup. The concept of the cup is a collection of man's sin until such a time that God pours it out in justice on those who committed the sins. This is perfect righteousness. This is putting on them what they did to others. And he speaks of this all the way through. Even in the, the tribulation period, there's the bowls of wrath, and these are being poured out upon the people who have done these things. So the cup that Jesus faced held the sin conditions, the thing that makes people do wrong, of every human being from Adam on to the end of the world. What a collection of sin conditions that is. How filthy and putrid is that? And just as he faced this horrible reality, just as that was happening, he would also lose his father's loving presence from him. We know this while he's on the cross, Matthew 27, 46. At about the ninth hour, starting at 6 o'clock, that'll be about 3 in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, by interpretation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now on one side, this was a quote from Psalm 22 because he knew that Psalm 22 was a prophecy of him on the cross. But the prophecy was a prophecy. He was not just repeating a prophecy. He was issuing the cry from his heart that the psalmist saw in prophecy. God was forsaking him. They say, how could he do that? Well, the father had to abandon him in this weak human condition as he contended for man's salvation. His dear father, with whom he had had a perfect relationship in eternity, had to stand by as a spectator, but even worse, as an adversary. God must hate the sin that now poured into Jesus. This is what he saw. This is a change in his very being that was going to happen to him on the cross. And this, dare I say, terrified him, shook him to the core. I think we can add to this what he knew was going to have to happen. Secondly, the Savior's temptations. You know when the devil loves to tempt you? When you're weak. When you're having problems. His temptation. Satan would tempt the Savior with doubt. Certainly Satan would suggest to him that he might leave God's pre-planned work unfinished. You can imagine if the very thought of being removed from God to bury your sin caused him this much trouble and distress, could he go through the whole process? And are these people even worth your sacrifice? Right now, as you suffer, your best friends are asleep. Your treasurer, Judas, is rushing to betray you. The world for whom you care so much will cast out your name as evil. What is your coming church worth? Weak humans that fail your purpose as they play 
in selfish sin. Satan, I think, would tempt the Savior with fear. It would go something like this. If the prospect of this sacrifice causes you so much terror, will your strength be sufficient? Probably his fear came from a sense of weakness. He was feeling that weakness. If the concept of God's reproach has already broken your heart, how could you bear the real thing? Your body is weakened by your long fasting. You will surely fail, Satan would say. But let us be sure that he did not fail. He did not yield to that temptation. Hebrews 4.15 summarizes it for us. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was victorious in all the temptation. And the third thing is that Satan would tempt the Savior with abandonment. Do you know what it's like to be abandoned, to be left alone entirely on your own resources? He would say, you can have no strength apart from your father. You have no friend anywhere. Your father forsakes you. No angel dare stretch out his hand to help you. No man really cares about you. Look at your closest human friends are asleep, ready to deny you. Your brother James has mocked you to your face. The people you want to save are lusting for your blood. The thousands you called to come to you, the thousands you fed miraculously, are far from you and do not understand what you're facing. Nobody cares. You're all alone. All these humans you care about belong to me, Satan says. They do my bidding. You will fail. I don't know if you can feel the sympathy have Satan tempting like that. We have another picture in this, however, in the Savior's bloody sweat. Much has been written about this. Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, this phenomenon, that was very unusual, has happened elsewhere. Uh, many uh, ancient uh, uh, medical people have written about it. It usually results in death. Uh, often they said that people were hung upside down and beaten and so on, that the actual blood began to seep through the, the skin of their faces. This case alone finds him surviving such agony, but he was bleeding through his skin. We see here our Savior in severe torment. His blood pounds up to his head and seeps out to the ground. This place, this situation is just unforgettable. A lonely place spotted with blood that has come from a feverish brow. A song we're familiar with, Jenny Evelyn Hussey wrote, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Can we just stand there with Peter, James, and John and see him in this agony, see the darkening of his skin and seeing it drip off onto the, onto the ground? But let me share with you also the Savior's prayer because he's praying but I find it hard to listen to. It was a lonely prayer. This was so personal. This was so a prayer that only he would make that he, he couldn't be with them. He couldn't ask them to pray with him, but only pray for him, to watch with him. So it was an absolutely lonely prayer. It was a humble prayer. This is the Son of God. This is a, a person of the triune God. This is the, the maker of heaven and earth who is now kneeling 
and asking and begging. Humble. It was a filial prayer, a family prayer. Matthew records him saying, Oh, my father. Mark records Abba, father. Uh, father in both the, the uh, Greek and the sort of Hebrew, Aramaic. And it was a persevering prayer. When you put them all together, he prayed three times using the same words, the scripture says. Three times. And it was an earnest prayer. Scripture says he prayed more earnestly. In other words, there was nothing ritual about this. There was nothing haphazard about this. Every word was driven by the depth of his heart. And then it was a resigned prayer, as ours must be. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He says, I'm not trying to impose my will over yours. But I'm asking if it's possible that I don't have to take in that sin, be separated from you. But not as I will, but as thou wilt. Well, I'm glad to say we see the Savior's victory in this. It's pretty clearly spelled out for us. I'm reminded when the Apostle Paul prayed three times for God to remove his thorn in the flesh, God told him, no, I want to use your fleshly weakness to emphasize that your power comes from me. And when he got that answer, he was not down, he was not upset, he was not grieving at God. Why didn't you answer my prayer? He was happy. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And what is his response? God doesn't listen to me. No, he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In my fleshly weakness, I get God's power. Bring it on, he says. Give me some more infirmities. It was that attitude that we see in Christ also praying three times. And when God said, this is it, this is the only way we can do it, I've searched heaven and earth and below the earth and there's no other possible way. So Jesus, having prayed three times, was left with the will of his Father that the cup of sin would be poured on him. But he would accomplish all he intended. Everything that the triune God had planned for, even before they created man, you will accomplish it. And his heaviness and his terror passed away. I want you to notice his mind was suddenly calm. He had said, my soul, including my mind, was troubled, you see. His mind is suddenly calm. His strength was restored, although by the help of an angel. I don't know what that was like. It says it appeared to him. So it was actually visibly there. Did he lay a hand upon him? Did he heal him like that? Was it words of comfort? Was it, your father says... He loves you always, and the separation will be brief. I don't know. But something strengthened him. But his assurance of victory was complete. Christ's battle was finished. Now he is in control. You see this completely. He said, I'm in an agony. I'm surrounded by grief. Luke 22, 45, 46. And when he rose up from prayer, was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep thee? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. <laughs> now his concern is again outward. Before it was really pretty much inside, wasn't it? 
his control when Jesus points him out to the army that came to collect him. Luke 22, 47, 48. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before him and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? He's in control. He's saying to, he's speaking to the conscience of Judas here. When the suddenly awakened disciples see him taken, they draw their swords. Jesus calms them down. Matthew 26, 52, 53. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I am helpless? Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? <laughs> These are words we don't use much. Here, what legion? Well, it could be as much as 6,000 soldiers per legion. What a reserve of power. If a legion is 6,000, he was threatening this little army with more than 72,000 vengeful angels. <laughs> I, I just have to imagine that when he mentions that, I wonder if there were 12 legions that were standing there ready to go. I can imagine that he says this and 12 legions of angels grip their weapons and turn to God the Father. Give us the word. We'll tear this world apart. No, he was not helpless. He was in control. Indeed, Christ's prayer accomplished all that he wanted and all that he needed. He was ready for the bloody night when Satan would think that he won only to discover he had been beaten by Christ's shed blood. Satan learned a little late that he had merely bruised Christ's heel, but Christ would later crush his head, promised in the Garden of Eden. Jesus became sin for you. He did not enjoy it. It terrified his very soul. He died in your place. So I ask, will you accept him and his perfect work for your salvation? In fact, why will you choose to die for your own sins? Well, everyone will if they don't have those sins taken care of. God who knows these things said it should be so. Listen to Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What do I have pleasure in? But that the wicked turn from his way and live. And now he just pleads, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die? Why do you choose to die, O house of Israel? And so he says to you, have you turned to me? I offer you eternal life. Because the sin has to be paid for either by my sacrifice or by your eternity in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, you've given us an opportunity in this very private prayer of Christ to hear and to imagine and to recognize that more than the physical beating more than the hanging by the wounds of hands and feet, more than the penetrating thorns about the skull. You had to deal with your pure spirit defiled by the sins of mankind, by my sin, by the sins of all who have heard me today. 
and that has changed the opportunity of us for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord Father there are those hearing me that have never given themselves to thee they have not asked you to be their savior that somehow think they can work it out on their own but this is not a doing of sin problem. This is the problem of the sin of their condition, the sin of their very life. The reason that they're tempted to sin is because they are a sinner. And if that's not paid for by you, they will have to pay for it themselves with an eternity of suffering. Father, I ask that you would bring the work of thy Holy Spirit to convict people of their sin, to help them to see that there's a way out, and to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I wonder if you would say, Pastor, I do not know for sure that if I were to die today that I would go to heaven to be with the Lord. But I would like to be sure. I would like to know I would like to be taken into the arms of God and said, welcome, my son, my child. Pray for me. If that's your prayer, would you slip your hands up? Say, pray for me. Yes, amen. Yes. Father, then, we just commit ourselves to thee. We ask, Father, that we know what needs to be done that we don't have to do things, we just have to receive. And Father, we ask that you might open our hearts, help us to see, help us to understand, and to accept, to say yes to you, to welcome you into our heart, and welcome your life into ours. We pray these things.